morning, friends, and welcome to worship on Palm Sunday. I have a few announcements as we are uh, now really into Holy Week. The first is that we have been uh, taking part in the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. We handed out fish banks here on campus, and I wanted to let you know that today is the day that we will be collecting that offering in person, but if you're watching this online, you can still contribute to that offering. One Great Hour of Sharing is an amazing ecumenical outreach, takes, takes partners from all around the globe and brings funds together to use for really urgent needs in our own community and around the world. For example, One Great Hour of Sharing uh, funds have been used for wildfire and uh, flood relief here in California, for hurricanes and tornadoes in other parts of our country, and for tsunamis and earthquakes that have happened around the world. So when you give these funds, it goes to a very efficient organization. Part of it is Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And so you can take confidence that the money you give will be well used. So I do encourage you to visit our website at sjcpress.org, and you can donate there. Or you could just Google one great hour of sharing, and I'm sure you will find a way to be able to contribute to this amazing offering. So again, I would encourage you to participate in this year's One Great Hour of Sharing offering. Also, as we move into Holy Week, we are beginning our sacred space time this week, which ordinarily would happen in person and in our narthex. But of course, here we are a year later and things are still so different. We're bringing sacred space to you. We have packets that are made with something for you to do every single day of the week to engage with the events of Holy Week and to, to take stock of, of what happened so many years ago, but what impact that has on our lives now. If you would like one of those kits, please contact our church office, and that is office at sjcpress.org, and you can find our con con contact information on our website as well. We'll find a way to get one of those packets to you if you would like it. And you may not receive it into Holy Week, but it will still be a very meaningful activity for you to participate in. We will be gathering by Zoom on Monday, Thursday, and you can contact the office again if you would like to participate in that and you're not on our regular church mailing list to receive our CPC Express. That'll be a Zoom invite. And then it will also contain a link to a Good Friday service that we have collaborated with other churches in our presbytery, and that will be available for you to view on Good Friday. And we will be gathering in person on the lawn on Easter Sunday for a glorious Easter Sunday service, but you are also will find us here online as well. So I do hope you will make plans to participate in Holy Week and in Easter here with us at Community Presbyterian Church. Good morning, would you join me in the call to worship? The story of faith is a story of courage. It took courage for John the Baptist to prepare the way. It took courage for Mary to say, here I am, use me. It took courage for the disciples to drop their nets and follow Jesus. It took courage for the paralyzed man's friends to lower him through the roof. It took courage for Peter to walk on water. It took courage for Zacchaeus to give half of his possessions to the poor. It took courage for Jesus to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Faith has never been easy. It is a journey of courage. Again and again, God, show us the way. Let us worship a brave and courageous God. Please pray with me. God of salvation, our Lord entered his passion to raise us to life in this holiest of weeks. Help us to walk the way of the cross that we may be raised in a resurrection like this and dwell forever in you, eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, Sunday School students. This Sunday is Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. On that day, Jesus rode through the streets of Jerusalem on a colt, a young donkey. He rode into town on this small donkey and showed the people of the city that he was a humble person. He was a person of peace. He was someone who put other people first. He didn't come in on a chariot. He didn't come in on a war horse. He came in on a donkey. Some people thought that Jesus had come to save them from their rulers, the Romans, 
that he'd come to fight them. But that's not what he meant when he said he was there to save people. He'd really come to show them a better way to live and a way to live that would save them from being separated from God. Jesus had to be so brave. He had to have more courage than I can even imagine. He had to have more courage than most people can imagine. Where does that kind of courage come from? His love of people and his love of God made him brave. Love made him willing to do anything, even give up his own life so that other people could have a better life, a life closer to God. We celebrate his courage. We think about the things in life that call for us to be brave in some way, and whether it's facing a new situation or standing up to a friend or saying no to things we know are wrong. We are not alone in any of it. God is there beside us. And we can ask God for the strength and the courage we need to help us do the right thing, the loving thing, the brave thing. Let's pray. God, thank you for the courage to do hard things. Help us to lean on you and help us to lean on each other when we need to be brave. Amen. listen to this call to confession. Glennon Doyle, a famous author and writer, frequently uses the phrase, we can do hard things. It's one of her many mottos in life. As a result, this declaration, we can do hard things, has become an anthem for so many. You can buy these words on poster prints, on greeting cards, and even coffee mugs. These five simple words aren't particularly radical. So when I stop to think about why they have caught hold for so many, I can only assume that it is because life and faith require courage. Vulnerability requires courage. Relationships require courage. Advocacy and justice require courage. Facing our privilege requires courage. Faith requires courage. Even confession requires courage. So friends, let us do hard things. Let us confess together, trusting that God is always there, cheering us on in every courageous act. Let us pray. God of palm branches and hallelujahs, we confess we love a good Palm Sunday celebration. We love the sound of a joyful parade we love shouting, hallelujah. We love that Palm Sunday means Easter is just around the corner. We love good news. However, 
If we slow down and pay attention, we know that Palm Sunday was not a walk in the park for you. There was risk. There was fear. There was the threat of violence. You were leading a peaceful protest against an unjust empire, and the whole world knew it. Forgive us for glossing over the courage this day took. Remind us that the story of faith is a story of courage. And even we can do hard things. With hope we pray. Amen. Now listen to these words of forgiveness. Family of faith, even when we gloss over the truth, even when our courage fails us, even when we doubt that we can do hard things, God believes in us. God loves us. God forgives us. Hear and believe this truth. We are known. We are loved. We are forgiven. Again and again and again. Amen. Our first reading today comes from John 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Friends, join me now as we ask for God to illuminate our hearts and minds as we join together in the prayer for illumination. If we could buy our way closer to you, we'd sell everything we have. If we could work our way closer to you, we'd never take a day off. If we could walk our way closer to you, we'd keep our tennis shoes on tight. But I know, we know, we cannot buy or work or walk our way closer to you, Lord. We must listen our way closer to you. So, holy God, as you have so often done again and again, open our ears. Clear out the self-talk that keeps us from you. Dust out the negativity and distractions. Remove any doubt hindering our way. Amen. Friends, it is Palm Sunday, and we will be hearing John's telling of this well-known story. As in last week's text, the story of Jesus raising Lazarus is just in the immediate background. It is the thing that has happened that the authorities, it's just the, th the straw that has broken the camel's back for them. The authorities of the church are hardening their resolve that Jesus must be removed and this even has implications for Lazarus, as you have heard. In the verses just prior, we see a glimpse into the heart of the authorities. They want to preserve the status quo because it suits them quite well. If they let Jesus go on like this, they say, everyone will believe in him, and this will bring Rome down on us. Because the religious authorities have made an uneasy alliance with that occupying power of Rome. 
Rome keeps its distance and lets them worship as they do, but they are always in a tenuous relationship, not wanting to attract too much attention, lest Rome come in and exact its power. So if Jesus goes on acting as he has been, in particular now raising a man from the dead, that is just too much attention for them. That might catch Rome's notice. Well, what's about to happen in this story will most certainly catch Rome's eye. After raising Lazarus, Jesus got out of Dodge and laid low for a while. But as the Passover festival approaches, when Jews travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, people are beginning to wonder if Jesus will come to Jerusalem because now he is a wanted man. The Passover festival, it is important to remember, celebrates the liberation of God's people from their captors, Egypt. When they literally walked out of Egypt as the hand of God parted this sea for them, made the way for them to flee the bonds of oppression. You've got to know Rome does not like this festival. And they're going to make sure that their presence is known there. So any added attention will not be welcome. This is a tense political time, and these people are about to, get, to engage in an overt political protest that says, Rome, you don't own us. Caesar, you are not our God. The temple, the religious authorities, are not going to be in favor of this at all. But this is why Jesus came. Jesus came to speak truth of the true God, the true worship of God, the one who we owe our allegiance to, and it's not Rome. We pick up the story where Megan read it earlier. Let's look at the different responses in that early part of the story with Mary boldly, courageously breaking that expensive bottle of perfume over Jesus' feet and wiping them with her hair. There's different responses. Judas's response is there. Mar Martha is there again. Two words. Martha served in that text. God love Martha. She's always there serving. She happens to be one of my personal favorites. But in this final week of his life, in this culmination of his message in ministry, it is Mary who acts boldly and with courage first. Mary, of all the people in this story, seems to have the greatest understanding of who Jesus is, of what he has been saying all along, and where all of this is leading him. She's seen the signs. She's heard the response. It was her brother that was raised from the dead. And she knows the, the, the fear that this has caused, both good and bad. People are coming in droves to see Jesus now attracting much too much attention for the temple authorities' comfort. Mary knows all of this. She knows what's coming as Jesus knows what's coming. And so she responds with this act of great, extravagant love and devotion, breaking this enormous amount of fragrant perfume over Jesus' feet and wiping it with her hair. All the gospel writers tell this story, although with different characters and in different settings and with different meanings, as we have discovered, they do. John, like the others, mentions the quality of the perfume she pours on Jesus' feet, but he alone makes mention of the quantity of the perfume. Hers is an extravagant act of love and devotion. The amount of this fragrance broken at his feet it fills the whole place. Hers is an act of love born of her understanding of what is about to happen. And it fills the space, the smell and the, the extravagance of her actions. It just fills the entire scene and everybody is riveted on what it is she is doing as she kneels at his feet and wipes them with her hair. Her act of devotion and service will point toward what Jesus is about to do. As they leave this place and go out into the city for this political po protest of a, of a palm parade of Jesus processing into Jesus, which we're going to read about in a minute, he immediately goes from there into the upper room. 
And what is the first thing he does there? He washes his disciples' feet and he wipes them. The same word is used. The same action is spoken of. As Mary has wiped Jesus' feet, that's what he will do for his disciples. Her act of courage perhaps even inspires his act of service. And then he will instruct the 12 to go and serve others as he has served them. He will tell them to love one another, that it is by love and service that the world will know that they are his disciples. Mary shows great courage in this extravagant act of love and devotion in the face of what she knows is coming. Judas is there. He seems to act with an avoidance of courage. He offers words of scornful disdain. But he's not wrong in his assessment. It was a lot of perfume and a lot of money. A lot of bellies could have been filled with that. So what, what is he doing wrong here? Why is Mary called faithful but Judas isn't? It seems that perhaps he has missed the meaning of Mary's act. He is not grasping the meaning of what it means that Jesus' hour has come. He's spoken about his hour and now it has, uh, has arrived. Mary has understood what this means. Judas perhaps has not Mary's anointing presages Jesus' final anointing. She knows that time is limited, so she is doing what must be done with the time she has left, and she is anointing him for his burial. I imagine that the fragrance might still be on him as he moves out into the crowd, as he spends that last night with his disciples, as he moves into the garden, and then he moves into the final hours of his life that that perfume might still fill his nose judas reflects on this with this scornful disdain and jesus tells him there is plenty of opportunity to address poverty if that is what you want to do john's commentary judges that perhaps that is not his true motivation but john is reading back into the text Either way, Judas, Jesus has found Mary's action as a faithful response to that hour and Judas' actions perhaps as not fully understanding what is coming and the appropriateness of what Mary has done. Let's pick up the story here in John's Gospel. This is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and I will be reading also in the 12th chapter, but this is verses 12 through 20 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The crowd is also acting with great courage. Unlike the synoptics, which spend a lot of words setting the stage for this triumphal entry about the preparation, about going and finding the donkey, finding things just as Jesus has said they would be, John doesn't say a word about any of that. Rather, in John's gospel, John has the crowds waving palm branches before Jesus even gets on the donkey. The crowd is greeting him as he rides into Jerusalem in the manner of a victorious king, Allah Psalm 118, the, the words of which they are citing here. 
they are already anticipating that this is the king they want, or at least they think they want. They've seen what he can do, and so they are ready to defy Rome in that moment and and cheer their king into the city. They've done it even before Jesus has gotten on the donkey. This takes great courage. Their song is a song from their oldest hymn book, a song that is sung for triumphant kings. Oh, this is going to catch Rome's notice for sure because they have their own processions exactly like this, only their processions are re- come on a mighty steed and a conquering hero and everybody comes out and it's a display all right and that display is to meant to remind the people who's in power who holds the power and who doesn't so these palm these processions they're not new people see them all the time they're having somebody who's not a conquering hero who's not sanctioned by rome they're crying for this person to ride in to rome that takes great courage they are participating in a political protest a march they're offering a triumphant greeting that was common for roman governors but for someone who was not roman This takes some courage on their part, hailing this new king, singing a song of liberation during Passover, the festival that celebrates their walking out of Egypt, throwing off the bondage of their oppressive captors. Can you imagine what it is they are doing, singing this song at this time? Jesus knows what it means, and he knows the power and the import of this moment. There will be no going back now. Unlike the Roman parades, Jesus rides in on a donkey, not a mighty steed, as was foretold in the scriptures of old. And People are demonstrating a different kind of king, bringing in a different kind of reign, one of compassion and service, not power and oppression. As the re- disciples reflect back on this event, As John writes their post-Easter perspective, it all makes sense now. This is why he was doing what he was doing all along. This is why he said what he said and did what he did. What he will encounter in the following days will be the greatest act of love and service, and it will require the greatest courage. It all makes sense in retrospect why all of this had to happen, what the meaning of the crowd was, what it meant that he rode in on a donkey, what it was that he was saying that led to this moment. After the fact, John lets us know it will all be clear to them why this had to happen the way that it did and what it took for him, this act of love and service and tremendous courage again and again we draw on courage this story reminds me of a story told to me by by my good friend and a friend of this congregation pastor jack lou jack was born in estonia a country that is only one year older than community presbyterian church having declared their republic in 1918 after 200 years of czarist rule that unraveled amid the turmoil of the First World War. But in 1940, the Soviets marched in, and in 1941, Germany invaded. And as Estonia was annexed at the end of World War II, this time to the Soviet Union, Jack's family fled their home, and in a tragic and heroic story, that is better told by Jack, so I'll save that part of the story for him. His family made their way to America. But in the following 50 years of Soviet occupation, Estonia saw their culture and their national identity stripped away, which is what occupiers do. Sounds like Rome. Their language was replaced. Their religion was banned. They weren't allowed to wave their own flag They were determined to maintain their cultural identity, 
So they did what Estonians do, which, which is such a rich cultural heritage for them. They sang. Then in Estonia, song is a long cherished form of expression. And at the song festival grounds near the capital of Tallinn, uh, in 1988, 300,000 people gathered, one third of the population. They gathered to sing as they had done for years and years before. Massive choirs would gather to sing and celebrate their culture. And as the USSR began to crumble, Estonia used song to declare their independence. On these festival grounds, thousands of people gathered to, sang, to sing, and hundreds of thousands of people gathered to listen. Jack tells the story of this national song festival. A choir of thousands, a crowd of hundreds of thousands, surrounded by armed Soviet military per personnel. And they sang bravely, courageously, the beloved songs of their ancestors. They couldn't speak their language. They couldn't worship the way they wanted to, but they sang. They sang patriotic songs dressed in, dressed in folk cost, costumes that were sewn by their grandmothers. Would there be a swift reaction? The Estonians kept singing. In 1989, they joined with their Baltic neighbors of Latvia and Lithuania and formed a human chain of two million people, hand in hand, across the countryside. Two million people, a human chain, a Baltic chain, stretching 400 miles from Vilnius, Lithuania, to Riga, Latvia, to Tallinn, Estonia, to protest the, for freedom for the Baltic states. The singing revolution lasted five years, peaceful and nonviolent, and Estonia gained their freedom. One million singing Estonians in the midst of 150 million Soviet occupiers. What a story of courage. When Jack shared that story with me, I heard the songs that the people were singing that day from Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. People singing for their freedom. Again and again, we draw on courage. How do you define courage? I can invite you to draw on courage, but I can't define courage for you. Only you know what courage looks like for you. Courage comes from deep within for sure. It comes from a strength that comes from I know not where, but it is there when you need it. It always is there, ready to be drawn upon for each one of us in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And sometimes that courage can rise higher when we are surrounded by those who are cheering us on, who are fighting for the same things, who are showing courage for the same cause, and our voices will rise even higher. I know many of you have shown great courage in your lives. I have heard your stories of what you have come up against and the courage that you have had to draw on. And your courage has inspired me and I'm thinking of you, Ryan, right now. Just this week, I witnessed the courage of two dear friends of mine who came together in spite of a disagreement that they had. But they chose to come together and seek reconciliation to talk about their, their differences and to remain in relationship in spite of their differences. That takes courage when it would be just so much easier to go separate ways. But they didn't. They came together, and they talked, and they found a way forward, each hearing the other and finding a way to remain in relationship. How do you define courage? How do you access it? What events in your life have required the most courage? 
offer a prayer perhaps in the prayer stations that we've been encouraging you to participate in in your own homes, perhaps writing that prayer on a piece of paper and adding it to the others that you perhaps have offered in this, these weeks up until now. Where have you shown courage? Thank God for giving you that courage deep within from that unknown place from which it springs. It's always there when you need it. But where do you need to show courage now? May you draw on the courage that is within you to continue the work to which God has called you, to speak truth to power, to speak along with those whose voices need to be heard, or to be quiet and make a space for those voices to speak louder than yours, to act with compassion when it would be easy and natural to exercise power, to speak against balance sometimes when a balance needs to be shifted and other voices need to be heard. Where do you need to show courage? What do you see in our society that needs to be spoken to, where truth needs to be spoken to power? Where will you find that courage to act or to speak or to be quiet? I want to close by calling your attention to a picture by Lauren Wright Pittman. It's the picture for this week. I, and Lauren Wright Pittman has this to say about this image. I hope this image serves as a reminder to call upon God for the courage you need, to rest and recharge for the work ahead. But I hope it also heartens you to move forward in courage, even in the midst of great resistance toward the work God is calling you into. My friends, that source of courage is there for you. It was there for each one of the people in our text this morning as Mary understood what was about to happen and acted boldly to anoint Jesus for what was to come. Courage was with the crowd as they embraced the king that they thought they were getting at that moment. We know the events of this week will, will change their tune. Courage was absolutely with Jesus, who understood from the very beginning what his message and ministry would lead to. That his speaking the truth to power would always lead him into a challenge with the authorities, both religious and political. He knew what this week would bring, and yet he acted in love and in service and with great courage. My friends, draw on that courage as well. It is there for you deep within. There are others standing with you, calling on their courage as well to act. In this time of, of great change in our society, as we move forward into something new, may we again and again draw on courage. Amen. Friends, let's take a moment now to affirm what it is we believe. I refuse to believe that I am powerless. I refuse to believe that injustice and hatred are simply the way it has to be. I refuse to believe that I am better or more deserving than my neighbor. I refuse to believe that my self-worth is rooted in my accomplishments or my appearance. I refuse to believe that the church is dying because I see God all around me. I refuse to believe that the traditions of old are the only path moving forward. I refuse to believe that I cannot make a difference. So with hope in my heart, I will strive to live a life of courage, conviction, and compassion, just as Jesus taught us. Amen.
Holy Week begins. Today we have cheered you as our champion and hailed you as our hero. Forgive us tomorrow when our enthusiasm wanes. Today we have entrusted you to rescue us from our circumstances. Forgive us on Tuesday when we decide we can take care of ourselves. Today we have made you the centerpiece of our very existence. Forgive us on Wednesday when we forget to remember who you are. Today we have called out to you loudly by name. Forgive us on Thursday when we pretend that we've never met you. Today we have stared at you with the star-struck eyes of admirers. Forgive us on Friday when we avert our eyes because it's too painful to see you on the cross. Today we have expressed our unsuppressed hopefulness in the future you have in store for us. Forgive us on Saturday when we believe all is lost. Today, we have been boldly certain of the earthly ways you will redeem us. Restore us on Sunday, when we are startled and awed by your rising. Friends, receive this charge and benediction. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, and go in peace, my friends. Amen. <laughs>